This program is brought to you by Emory University. Well, good afternoon. Welcome to our Family Forum series. It's a privilege to see all of you here. Thank you very much for coming, especially in light of the inclement weather. My name is John Witte. I serve as director of the Center for the Interdisciplinary Study of Religion, the sponsor of today's forum. Our center is devoted to studying the religious sources and dimensions of cardinal themes and issues that lie at the intersection of law, politics, and society. One of our center projects is an in-depth exploration of children. We are studying the rites and rituals attached to birthing and naming, baptism and circumcision, education and discipline. We are studying the steps and stages of a child's physical, emotional, sexual, moral, and spiritual formation, and the rituals and ordeals and the rights and responsibilities that attach to each stage. We are studying the pathos of child abuse and rape, child poverty and homelessness, juvenile delinquency and violence, illegitimacy and infanticide. And we are studying the mystery of the child, that unusual combination of innocence and imagination, acuity and candor, caring and healing that uniquely become a child. The Family Forum series is devoted to public discussion of some of these themes. Last year, we focused on children in crisis. This year, we are focusing on the challenges of children, the challenges they pose to us as parents and siblings and citizens, and the challenges they pose to our social institutions, most notably our political and religious institutions and the voluntary associations alongside. You will see on the program before you a number of forums that I hope will beckon you to return to this auditorium often in the course of this academic year. Our forum today will focus on the challenges posed to children, families, and religious groups by the Bush administration's faith-based initiatives program. This is the latest phase in America's long and delicate experiment in balancing church and state democracy and welfare, individual freedom, and collective responsibility. Our speaker today is my good friend and colleague, Professor Stephen M. Tipton. Professor Tipton is one of the intellectual treasures of this Emory University campus. He is professor of the sociology of religion and former director of the graduate division of religion, one of our strongest graduate programs. He is also senior fellow in our center and was co-convener of the center's major international conference last year on sex, marriage, and family, and the religions of the book that brought 80 speakers and 700 participants to this campus. Professor Chipton has published scores of articles and a number of important books. His book titles range from an early entry, Getting Saved from the 60s, to his most recent title, Meaning and Modernity. In between, he published with Robert Bella and others two blockbuster volumes, Habits of the Heart and the Good Society. He has printing on his computer as we speak, his latest volume based on a decade of research entitled Public Pulpits. Today, we get an advanced look into this new title in preparation through this lecture provocatively entitled Why Churches Say No. Challenges Faith-Based Initiatives Posed to Religion and Family. Will you please join me in welcoming our teacher, our friend, and our colleague, Professor Stephen M. Tipton. Thank you, John, and let me thank all of you for joining us here today. Uh, in the lull before the storm. Let's uh, see what we can do to stir things up in the meantime. What's wrong with compassion? And why in the world would churches oppose its enactment to help the least of these in America today? Unless, of course, they're opposing it in a political world where compassion is ideologically entangled with conservatism and where faith-based initiatives 
serve partisan interests and ends, for example, in reassuring moderate voters that public provision and taxes can be cut without hurting the needy or harming the common weal. Yes, political interests and ideologies do figure in the public debate and legislative struggle over faith-based initiatives. But something more is being contested here, I want to suggest today. That something reaches to our highest ideals and deepest convictions about the role of faith in public, about the good of government, and about their institutional interrelation in a society worth living in and working for. What is the role of religion in American public life? Prophetic witness, voice of conscience, social activist and reformer, moral advocate and interlocutor? Or is it instead good Samaritan and helping hand, loving heart and saving grace, exemplary community volunteer and charitable donor? The answers are many and diverse, sometimes linked and sometimes at odds, woven through the history of American ideals and actions, movements, and institutions. And each answer carries with it a distinctive vision of good government interacting with communities of faith within the polity of a democratic republic. This is a moral drama where both justice and compassion and practice attest to the moral integrity of our society as a whole even as church and state remain separate characters as institutions, each governed by their own members. So let's see how these contrasting visions of a good society inform the public argument over faith-based initiatives. Within days of his inauguration, President George W. Bush signed two executive orders to support faith-based programs and community groups that perform social services the first created a new White House Office of Faith-Based and Community Initiatives to oversee fair and supportive government cooperation with all such groups. The second created centers in five government agencies, Justice, HUD, Health and Human Services, Labor and Education, to clear away bureaucratic barriers in the path of these private groups seeking government support but wary of government regulation. Now, much of the immediate controversy surrounding the initiative focused on the dangers of its violating the separation of church and state, to risk religious meddling in publicly funded social welfare efforts, or threaten political interference in matters religious. For example, by government unfairly favoring some religious groups over others. Within weeks, 850 members of the clergy signed a petition backed by the Baptist Joint Committee, the American Jewish Committee, and the United Church of Christ to oppose the Bush plan in order, quote, to keep government out of the churches, temples, synagogues, and mosques. Within days, liberal and moderate Baptist leaders had urged rejection of the initiative on church-state grounds. Executives of Catholic Charities and Lutheran Services in America had criticized its permitting public aid to religious agencies that discriminate in preferential hiring of the faithful. Jewish leaders have found it appalling to think that hate groups like the Nation of Islam could receive public funds under the initiative. Heads of many smaller religious groups have found equal treatment of diverse faiths a cause for concern in the process of government picking one faith-based social service provider over another on best results grounds, easy to declare yet difficult to put into fair practice. Conservative white evangelical leaders, including Pat Robertson, split over equal access to public funding once the administration had decided that indivisibly conversion-centered programs would be eligible for support only through individual vouchers, not direct grants, because their essential uh, mission and method required religious conversion, for example, to overcome addiction by accepting Christ as one's personal Lord and Savior. By a ratio of three to one, many urban black ministers proved more willing than their suburban white counterparts to seek government aid, regulatory strings and all, to meet the challenges of more pressing social needs with fewer resources of their own. In the welter of this debate to weigh the political impact of faith-based initiatives, detail its operation in practice, and predict which religious groups would benefit 
um, or plague, it would benefit or plague with problems, relatively little attention was paid to the initiative's overarching meaning and its underlying principles. Let's do that now. President Bush harked back to his inaugural address in announcing the initiative. He stressed that compassion is the work of a nation, not just a government. We're called by conscience to respond to deep needs and real suffering in the shadow of Americans' affluence. Problems like addiction and abandonment and gang violence, domestic violence, mental illness, and homelessness. Compassion, he said, is the calling of citizens who turn mean streets into good neighborhoods and cold cities into real communities. This approach rests on a distinction between the moral aims and responsibilities of governmental and religious institutions. This distinction, Mr. Bush spelled out as follows, quote, government has important responsibilities for public health or public order and civil rights and government will never be replaced by charities and community groups. Yet, when we see social needs in America, my administration will look first to faith-based programs and community groups, which have proven their power to save and change lives. This priority given to religious and community charities over governmental responsibility for meeting social needs in America is clear and striking. It draws its moral force and plausibility from positing that social needs, these social needs, occur in personal terms of lives that need to be saved and changed by the power of religious faith and charitable love of neighbor in order to overcome addiction, abandonment, and domestic violence, for example. These contrast to the structural terms of political economic problems, such as adequate work, wages, health care, and affordable housing to sustain families on the lower rungs of the social ladder. These structural problems instead put the onus on governmental legislation, policy, and public provision. Mr. Bush's priority placed on religious and community charities also relies on a functionalist logic of improving society by saving it one soul at a time. Through forms of what he calls social entrepreneurship, that combine both faith-based programs and non-religious community programs into an ideal of social agency seen as uniquely innovative and effective. This ideal of social entrepreneurship, at once faith-based and market-based, joins revivalist religion and libertarian political belief together to make religious organizations largely indistinguishable from community social agencies except by the faithful motives of the individuals involved in them. Thus, President Bush welcomed working through the White House Office of Faith-Based and Community Initiatives with a fantastic team, as he put it, of social entrepreneurs all across America who have heard the universal call to love a neighbor like they'd like to be loved themselves, who exist and work hard not out of love of money, but out of love of their fellow human beings. Faithful social entrepreneurs work no less hard out of universal love of neighbor in the voluntary sphere of religious charities and community civic efforts than do economic entrepreneurs out of love of money in the commercial sphere of the market. By supporting such faithful social entrepreneurs, government gives priority to religious charities and community volunteers to meet social needs beyond the irreplaceable but minimal legal responsibilities of government for public health, public order, and civil rights. Where does this leave religious institutions, per se? They provide faithful volunteers for charitable and civic programs. They benefit from public funding to become stronger providers in themselves of social services with a peculiar power to save and change lives. Political rebuttal to the Bush plan highlighted just how partial arguable and inconclusive is evidence in support of the relative success of faith-based social services compared to non-religious service providers in their effort to rehabilitate drug addicts, train the jobless, and teach the illiterate to read. But this debate threw little weight and little light on just how deeply Bush's view in favor of religious communities as social service providers ignored the public role of religious institutions as conscientious moral witnesses, critics 
and advocates of government's responsibility to make American society more just as well as more compassionate. The continuing commitment of the mainline Protestant churches to defining this public role over the past generation has been no less striking than their difficulty in enacting it successfully. This contest between contrasting ideals of faith of public and the good of government marks a matter of moral conflict and quandary, not simply a conflict of political interests and ideologies. To see just how deeply grounded is this contest in convictions about the balance of compassion and justice in the moral integrity of American society as a whole, it's worth looking back at the way Bush's inaugural address distinguishes these two virtues and interrelates them in practice. So let's do that. We'll look back at faith and compassion and justice in the uh, inaugural address, a beautifully written and carefully conceived speech that in about 15 minutes um, mentions religion more than a dozen times. By contrast to the more austere Calvinist rhetoric forged under pressure to meet the crisis of 9-11, and echoing Franklin Roosevelt's wartime speeches, the larger record of President Bush's moral rhetoric tells a more distinctive story about the limited good of government and the personal nature of faith in public. It lifts up a vision of compassionate citizens inspired by a soft, benign, evangelical faith, much more at odds with the, quote, prophetic ideals and practices at the faithful heart of the mainline Protestant churches. The grandest American ideal is an unfolding promise, Mr. Bush began in his inaugural address, that everyone belongs, that everyone deserves a chance, that no insignificant person was ever born. Bush affirms a new commitment to live out our nation's promise through civility, courage, compassion, and character. Among these virtues, Bush gives the greatest emphasis and elaboration to compassion, in the following key passage. America at its best is compassionate. In the quiet of American conscience, we know that deep persistent poverty is unworthy of our nation's purpose. And whatever our views of its cause, we can agree that children at risk are not at fault. Abandonment and abuse are not acts of God. They are failures of love. And the proliferation of prisons, however necessary, is no substitute for hope and order in our souls. Americans in need are not strangers. They're citizens, not problems, but priorities. Government has great responsibility for public safety and public health, for civil rights and common schools. Yet compassion is the work of a nation, not just a government. And some needs and hurts are so deep they will only respond to a mentor's touch or a pastor's prayer. Church and charity, synagogue and mosque, lend our communities their humanity, and they will have an honored place in our plans and in our laws. I pledge our nation to a goal. When we see that wounded traveler on the road to Jericho, we will not pass to the other side. America at its best is a place where personal responsibility is valued and expected. Our public interest depends on private character, on civic duty and family bonds and basic fairness, on uncounted, unhonored acts of decency which give direction to our freedom. Sometimes in life we're called to do great things, but as a saint of our times has said, every day we're called to do small things with great love. The most important tasks of a democracy are done by everyone. Here, the virtue that marks America at its best is held up as a moral inspiration and duty to respond to persistent poverty, proliferating imprisonment, and Americans in need. Compassion is both paired with justice and placed before it in practical importance. In the political de debate and moral argument of American public life, Deep and persistent poverty may point to injustice, injury, and exploitation. It raises questions of cause and culpability that in turn guide efforts to seek greater justice in the law, public policy, and the arrangement of social institutions. In the quiet of American conscience, 
by contrast. Poverty is, first of all, something unworthy of our nation's promise that everyone belongs and deserves a chance. They deserve not only opportunity, but justice in the nation Bush pledges to work to build. That justice is presumably participatory and distributive, not just retributive and commutative. That's to say, it requires honest work at a living wage, for example, for all who can labor and thereby support themselves, provide for their children, and contribute to the common weal. Compassion, to be sure, acknowledges disagreement over the causes of poverty and the necessity of proliferating prisons, but it stresses instead the innocence of children at risk, abandoned and abused from failures of love. It announces a moral duty to respond to suffering. It acknowledges the great responsibilities of government, and it notes the need for civic duty and basic fairness to sustain the public interest. But it emphasizes the duty of individual citizens to respond to one another in need, to listen to those who feel the pain of poverty, and to answer their hurt and suffering with a healing touch or a pastoral prayer. Governments responsible for public safety and public health, civil rights and common schools, yet compassion is the work of a nation, not just a government. And Bush pledges the nation to being a biblical good Samaritan to its wounded citizens. They're not strangers, but by implication, are biblical neighbors. Mr. Bush acknowledges governmental responsibility and honors the example of voluntary communities of faith. But what he stresses is personal responsibility as a call to conscience, a demand for sacrifice, and a promised path to personal fulfillment through finding that children and community are the commitments that set us free. Civic duty, family bonds, and basic fairness all underpin our public interest, but first and last, it depends on private character and on the uncounted, unhonored acts of decency persons freely choose to do every day of their own accord. Such acts are the stuff of sainthood, according to Mother Teresa's maxim, that every day we are called to do small things with great love, and they are the stuff of democracy when they're done by everyone. Here we stand at the functional intersection of evangelical Protestant faith and free market libertarian belief. Here we celebrate each person's compassionate feeling for others, and it inspires good Samaritan service to them without constraining the sovereignty of individual conscience and choice or infringing the liberty of individual rights and entrepreneurial action. What's missing? Conspicuous by its absence from this moral vision of faithful individuals freely serving one another out of love is the Calvinist emphasis in the reformed tradition of American Protestantism on lawful social justice and covenantal virtue in accord with divine sovereignty and natural law. Also absent are its counterparts in the naturally lawful and virtuous corporatism of Catholic social teachings in the biblical covenant and holiness of Jewish law. Missing, too, is the conciliar character of the synagogue or church, whether Presbyterian or Episcopal in its polity, whose members make up a public sphere or forum of their own to deliberate and debate common questions, and likewise to take part in the moral argument of the polity at large as exemplary advocates and interlocutors. Struck by the moral rhetoric and models this inaugural address both emphasized and omitted, many mainline church leaders stressed the importance of what the Bush administration would go on to do or leave undone in carrying out the responsibilities of government and leading the nation along the exemplary path of the Good Samaritan. Now let's tack back to moral advocacy and the political process. Religious, civic, and civil rights groups lined up on both sides of the faith-based legislation debated in the House in 2001. They did so along with religious lobbies, moral advocacy groups, labor unions, and professional guilds. Cross-cutting interests and mixed ideals played out with multivalent commitments to diverse constituencies to overdetermine who came down where as political bedfellows. Conservative white evangelical groups led by Barry, uh, Gary Bauer with Pat Robertson dissenting vigorously were joined by the Southern Christian Leadership Conference in endorsing the bill for example, and by the U.S. Catholic Conference and Habitat for Humanity. Opposing the measure were the NAACP 
the American Association of University Women, the ACLU and most labor unions, as well as the United Church of Christ and most Jewish denominations and organizations. Some mainline churches, such as the United Methodist Church, Mr. Bush's own church, and the largest mainline Protestant denomination, adopted no official position in the legislative struggle, but they took a stance in the moral argument over faith-based initiatives. The Methodists released a detailed report that summed up arguments for and against charitable choice, including its threat to, quote, mute the prophetic voice of churches, including criticism of government. They pointedly observed that no new money is allocated by the initiatives for social services and community programs, and to date, no new funding channels or mechanisms have been set up under it. The report stressed that Bush's plan for faith-based and community initiatives reflects, quote, a bipartisan movement toward a market-driven approach to social service legislation. That is, what do consumers require and how does a free market, perhaps using public monies, meet the need? The Methodist report linked this approach to the legacy of welfare reform in 1996 and its continuing influence on political thinking about the church's role in overcoming poverty, seen as the result of personal irresponsibility and lack of initiative. But the broader array of the actual causes and outcomes of poverty, the report argued, on the contrary, requires changes in the political economic system and in the exploitive relationships between the powerful and the powerless in order to reduce poverty. These changes must begin with the recognition that we do not hold poor people morally responsible for their economic state. After the House bill passed, the fate of faith-based legislation in the Senate appeared uncertain by mid-2001, and so it remained thereafter through a series of complex legislative maneuvers in Congress, bold executive orders, and hopeful public announcements by the White House. By mid-2002, the legislative director of the United Church of Christ on Capitol Hill concluded that, quote, ch charitable choice agenda has been marginalized, in good part by the progressive advocacy efforts of the mainline churches. By then, the White House was lobbying Congress less confidently in favor of charitable choice since, as the president put it, the process debate bogged down. But Mr. Bush continued to advocate with no less conviction for faith-based initiatives over the course of his term and along the campaign trail in 2004. Government can hand out money, the President declared two months ago, as he championed compassionate conservatism at the Knights of Columbus Convention, but government can never, quote, put love in a person's heart or a sense of purpose in a person's life. As when a loving soul puts their arm around you and says, what can I do to help you? How can I help in your life? What can I do to make your life better? Many are called by God to do so, and government must stand on the side of these millions of acts of mercy and kindness that take place on a daily basis. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, countered John Kerry two weeks ago to members of the nation's largest African-American denomination at the National Baptist Convention. Quote, for four years, George W. Bush may have talked about compassion, but he's walked right by. By mid-2003, mainline church leaders had raised their voices in greater unity against the administration's faith-based initiative, with stronger orchestration provided by the National Council of Churches. They could no longer remain silent, they explained, after several years of economic recession, the impact of federal and state cuts in social welfare spending, combined with an additional $100 billion plus to pay for war in Iraq and Afghanistan in the wake of 9-11, and a $350 billion tax cut targeted to wealthy households with scant relief for the working poor. Backed by the National Council and convened by the liberal evangelical leader Jim Wallace in the name of a call to renewal, this broad coalition of mainline church leaders addressed a Pentecost letter to President Bush. Signed by the National Council's head, Robert Edgar, and a score of top denominational officers, the letter charged, quote, the poor are suffering because of a weakening economy. The poor are suffering because of resources being diverted to war and homeland security. And the poor are suffering because of a lack of attention in public policy. 
The tax cut offers, quote, virtually no help for those at the bottom of the economic ladder, while those at the top reap windfalls. And the resulting spending cuts in health care, education, and social services fall heaviest on the poor. Without serious changes in the policies of the Bush administration, the poor would suffer even more, and communities of faith committed to their aid would feel even more overwhelmed and betrayed, warned the church leaders. The lack of a consistent, coherent, and integrated domestic policy that benefits low-income people makes our continued support for your faith-based initiative increasingly untenable, they concluded. It's time to talk, they urged in a plea that went unanswered. Both mainline church supporters and critics of faith-based initiatives were left at last to face up to the challenge Jim Wallace defined in his initial diagnosis of the real danger posed to public faith by government backing for religious delivery of social services. Quote, those in power often prefer the service programs of religious groups to their prophetic voice for social justice. But in the biblical tradition of prophets like Isaiah, the religious community is called to speak truth to power. To answer the question of how religious groups can safeguard their prophetic voice as they partner with government, Wallace quoted President Bush himself, quoting Martin Luther King as saying, the church must be reminded that it is not the master or the servant of the state, but rather the conscience of the state. In practice, added Wallace, that means evaluating all of an administration's policies, not just those it puts forth for charitable care of the poor. Will people of faith challenge excessive tax cuts and budget priorities that benefit the wealthy and deprive us of resources to fight poverty, asked Wallace. Will we insist on health care for the 10 million children with no coverage? Will we advocate for poor working families who need livable incomes and affordable housing? Mainline church leaders in Washington have continued to ask their members these questions and to ask themselves how they can put into effective prophetic action their prayerfully affirmative answers. At the same time, in and outside the churches, Concerned citizens continue to face related signs of the times in the longer run that extends beyond this administration or this election. They do so amid diverging fortunes and diminished dreams of middle-class progress for all of a people of plenty. One of four Americans today earns less than the $8.70 per hour needed to keep a family of four above the official poverty line. Nearly one in three working families with children under 12, many with two parents, working full-time jobs at low wages and earning incomes well over the poverty line have faced at least one critical hardship over the course of a year, such as going without food, being evicted, and failing to receive needed medical care, according to a 2001 study by the Economic Policy Institute. Without higher wages or a stronger social safety net, Work alone cannot ensure a decent standard of living for many families on the lower half of the income ladder in American society. And charity alone cannot make up the shortfall. What we own and owe only underscores the problem. One-sixth of American households today owe more than they own. The bottom one-third average less than $10,000 in net worth. The middle fifth of American households own 3.9% of our nation's wealth, their smallest share since 1962. The top fifth own 84% of all wealth. In 2001, government spending was smaller as a percentage of the U.S. national economy than at any other time since the 1960s, while one in six American children were living in poverty, roughly the same proportion as in 1979, and well above the rest of the industrialized world. The U.S. actually committed some 24.5% of its growth domestic product to social spending after taxes, comparable to Sweden at 27%, Britain at 26%, and the Netherlands at 25%. But in the distribution of its benefits, U.S. social spending is skewed sharply upward by virtue of including some seven to $800 billion per year granted by a hidden welfare state in the form of income tax credits and deductions that go to the better off in proportion to what they spend and save on home mortgage interest in particular, 
also on private health insurance, pension plans, and yes, higher education. We help the neediest, but we give more help to the most deserving, it seems, in terms of what they earn, spend, and save. Indeed, as fiscal conservatives protest, since 9-11, the federal government has shot up spending and deficits to pay the mushrooming costs of middle class entitlements, as well as to pay for war, and to do it by writing checks against our children's future. Americans remain deeply divided over what to think and do about these matters, particularly when it comes to voting and paying taxes or wages. However united they stand on the power of prayer and the value of volunteer work. If we seek to understand the good of government more aptly and persuasively, we need to ponder the good of do-gooding more fully and faithfully. Thinking twice about why mainline churches disagree over faith-based initiatives is one small step in this larger moral and social inquiry. Thank you for taking it with me. The floor is open. And, uh, is that when you say why the churches are saying no, I ask the question, are the churches really saying no? Because it seems to me that you're confusing um, the leadership and the denominations with being the church, not really paying attention to congregants, because public opinion tells us that for the most part, most Americans, except for Jews, are very much in favor of saying yes to this kind of compassionate conservatism. Great point. In, uh, in one sense, yes, as I'm implying, however gently at the end, at least part of the enemy is us. That is, those of us who sit in the pews of many of the churches across the middle of our society. At the same time, um, when you ask Americans about, quote, compassionate conservatism or faith-based initiatives, what you get are relatively high answers in principle, but then when you specify in practice about, say, preferential hiring, or uh, how much can be given to whom, under what circumstances to do what, actually the opinions of support fall off and they become much more selective. This is one reason why um, white, uh, quote, conservative evangelicals, many of them wound up opposing uh, the Bush plan because it seemed to retain discrimination in the form of discrimination against, quote, uh, indivisibly conversionist-centered programs. So uh, the kind of questions about a sort of broad uh, middle class um, moral constituency um, that's also, in uh, a significant part, uh, a constituency of folks in the pews is quite a posit. And uh, the kind of uh, character of public provision um, that is, um, by the usual measures, uh, in our case, remarkably oriented toward the middle, in some ways inverted in its proportion, once you add in the, quote, hidden public provision uh, forms of uh, tax deduction, uh, write-off, and give-back, is substantial. And we look different than every other society in the world, every other industrialized society. And that may well have something to do with the difference that we look like in terms of measures of inequality. Where we look more like, well, we're between Turkey and Portugal, 16 to 22, rather than uh, you know, with, uh, uh, the standard, the usual suspects in that regard. If you could comment, either in terms of national evidence, but certainly in Georgia, we've had uh, a great deal of um, controversy over, over the question of chaplaincies and who's taking care of the prisoners. And it's really has, the doors have been opened to entrepreneurial religion uh, in the prisons. Uh, is there something you could say to us about that? Because clearly there are a number of very, very competent chaplains now without a job in Georgia in the penal institutions. Don, I think you're uh, way ahead of me on that, specific to uh, the chaplaincies, and I'd like to turn the tables uh, on that one. 
But I, I think it is significant in the inaugural address that the matter of prisons in particular uh, and their proliferation is held up as what may well be, is probably, uh, quote, a matter of necessity. Um, but still, this question of, well, then what should we do? And uh, um, uh, uh, the matter of, uh, of uh, touching and healing and transforming the hearts of those incarcerated is in one sense, like many other proposals here, unarguable. In another sense, um, we'd have to step back to and into the legislative process to think about, well, which laws were violated, uh, how do they bear, uh, obviously, the enormous explosion of incarceration um, for uh, drug violations, um, specifically for crack cocaine as opposed to powdered cocaine and uh, so on, and the uh, kind of enormous skew of the results of those laws and their violation uh, are worth looking at. Step back another step, and what's worth looking at is how powerfully um, that correlates not only with race, um, but by uh, class and occupation, especially as tied to education. And so this larger picture of, uh, and this is a generation long, um, and it's not um, specific to uh, one administration or another, to one party or another, the transformation of, um, if you will, the kind of deflection of this secular sort of anthropodicy, uh, the prospect of progress being extended across the middle class um, to the whole society of, uh, and uh, hope in uh, a better life for one's children than oneself. All of that actually correlates very powerfully with the doubling of the size of the American middle class and real uh, per capita income between 1946 and 68. And since that point, um, there is a remarkable kind of skew in the impact of really structural economic changes um, that go around the world in terms of globalization, in terms of jobs in particular, also in terms of wages. That uh, if you're bright collar, um, if you're in the top uh, quintile or decile, like most of us in this room, you are, relatively speaking, protected and safe and uh, able to keep hoping with very good reason. Down below, things have gotten tighter. The middle class has expanded, and now it is being pinched. And uh, uh, the kind of correlation um, with that, with education, with wages, with family uh, difficulty and conflict is very powerful and has implications on both sides of this, including folks fighting for family values, that declines in public participation from voting to other forms of civic volunteering are striking over the last generation as opposed to the generation before as you go down the social economic ladder, that actually church-going, quote, conservative white evangelicals and church-going African Americans are two exceptions to this kind of decline. And they are, as it were, um, uh, part of the, uh, the, uh, the exceptions to the rule that are uh, a good story about public participation for all the kinds of, of protest and complaint at loggerheads uh, um, that are sometimes seen emanating from religious groups, especially, quote, uh, conservative religious groups. Now, I haven't answered your question. And, and I might say, Don, that, that the notion of changing the heart of, the, uh, of prisoners is uh, also tied to what looks to be, quote, the failure of liberal forms of penology, rehabilitation, okay. social transformation uh, to do the job. And, uh, and in fact, uh, that, uh, as well you know, is a kind of continuing moral uh, debate, not just a debate about social policy, in which there is, at least to, quote, liberalize, uh, a fair amount of evidence that no, all sorts of programs have done uh, a very significant job from Head Start to uh, real job programs. And in one sense, that's a debate uh, that has quieted down or subdued over the last decade and where both parties have reached uh, at least a measure of convergence. And uh, uh, as it were, the, the argument over one incumbency party um, as well as two parties that do disagree on all sorts of things. Yeah, the only comment is just I was struck by how the entrepreneurially religious uh, have really been given open doors, uh, whereas, uh, you know, uh, mainline support for um, perhaps, shall we say, more sophisticated or more informed in certain ways prison ministry uh, has gone by the board. And, and it's, it's particularly true here in Georgia for, for any of you who've follow this issue. That was, that was the main thing that I wanted to tie in with your, your notion. And of course, if we took an economic reading of who's in there and who's most likely to be imprisoned, uh, 
in the next five years and so on. Then we've got another economic, social economic factor. But it's entrepreneurial religion of, of that sort that's really has the door open to them, and it doesn't cost the public anything. I mean, that's the, that's the tie-in with your main thesis here. I mean, one of them. Of his uh, faith-based prison program at Lottie and one other, I guess. Uh, and that's the place where they have run into problems with extremist groups coming into these prisons and getting funding and getting access to the prisoners, even groups, Christian uh, identity groups, Nation of Islam, and some of the other uh, more extremist groups have, have, who are not necessarily getting funding for providing social services in the cities are getting access into these prisons in Florida and, and, and will elsewhere as that grows. So the sword of non-discrimination cuts uh, two or more ways, and that's been a continuing theme through the legislative debate. And the different forms of discrimination and the difficulties of uh, public funding of uh, religious communities uh, to do uh, the provision of social services. And uh, I mean, I'd, uh, I, I think that's a good example. the uh, leadership, the Washington offices, the New York offices of the liberal Protestant denominations and the congregations. Because it seems to me like a study like Ram Canans, which was more of liberal Protestant churches, which was looking at the actual social provision of congregations, is suggesting that um, congregations in a, in a disorganized way, you could say, are doing a lot of social provision. Absolutely. Um, and are understanding that as one of their roles. What it, but Chavez makes a little comment where he says, and it's interesting that the congregations don't really do anything political. Uh, and there's where you see the split between the congregations and the leadership, because the leadership is practicing a form of public theology, looking at the structural issues, lobbying, you know, all that. And the, while at the, the, the broader, the local levels of the church are, are, are engaged in these kinds of provision, but that, that thinking does never move forward, as you're suggesting, to the underlying structural questions. And I just wondered, as you keep working with this, if you've thought of, if you can imagine, or if you've seen the denominations imagining any ways that that split can be uh, overcome. Yeah, um, uh, again, uh, point well taken. Particularly 
Ralph Kielbunt, the uh, Rex in the second. We um, invited the top three people in the Faith-Based Initiatives office to come here, and when they heard it was Steve Tipton, they all ducked. <laughs> and so I'm going to try to mimic their question. And the question they may ask is this. We have suffered in this country, says the operative of the Faith-Based Initiatives program, by abstemious, if not slavish, adherence to the separation of church and state, such that we have cut out of the social welfare system the historical ally to political authorities, namely religious groups. Finally, in this faith-based initiatives program, we have made bold to answer the U.S. Supreme Court's invitation over the last few years to rethink our positions on separation of church and state. And we have now put in place a program to allow for voluntary participation by religious groups in the delivery of charity and other forms of social welfare to our neediest citizens. You can critique this, Professor Tipton, with a wonderful critique of my entire administration's policy on all manner of things, of taxation and military and all the rest. But the fact of the matter is we are putting hundreds of millions of dollars back in front of the people in the streets who need the money the most, and we're using a fundamental conduit, namely religious organizations, to deliver those services in a way they uniquely can and without having to rebuild, without having to inflate the bureaucracy. And so putting aside all the disclaimers about our tax policy and military policy and the like, what's wrong with our trying to help people in need and enlisting those who have been doing this for 4,000 years in the delivery of same? That would be the, tip, the question to Tipton by the Faith-Based Initiative Office, I think. Thank you, John. Just one more indication of why you should run for higher office, if not the highest office in the land. Uh, two points, um, and both of them uh, less arguments than observations. The first point is, uh, contra any picture of the uh, public square depleted of the faithful and of their uh, moral advocacy, um, the facts are just uh, the opposite, that we have actually increased uh, moral advocacy as well as specifically religious advocacy, more religion-like advocacy in our polity, that it is now more densely crowded, formally organized, that the number of advocacy groups that are religiously related, not just denominationally related, in some ways that's the least of these, um, uh, has mushroomed, that in 1960 there were maybe 30 national public affairs uh, organizations not tied to this or that denomination or church uh, on the public scene. Um, today, uh, well, by, say, mid-1980s, it was about 300. Today, it's probably 1,000 or more. At the same time that this, and this kind of tenfold growth above specifically church offices um, and denominational agencies, at the same time, the proliferation of moral advocacy groups that are not explicitly religious is probably by a factor of 10 yet again. We have, an, as it were, an individualistic polity where we've got state expansion, a big and uh, apparently powerful uh, state, but it's very permeable. And so we have had a kind of, of uh, sort of ongoing multiplication as well as increased division and increasingly integrated national argument about how we ought to do things like public provision. And um, the money, quote, has gone up too um, uh, uh, well before uh, this administration or this go-around on uh, faith-based initiatives. And that's really the second point, which is that if you look at the character of our public provision, not just this or that, uh, quote, welfare or work for, fair program. What's remarkable about it is that it is uh, actually quite generous, but it is distributed differently. And uh, it increasingly uh, has gone to the middle class and the upper middle class uh, as a part of the tr larger transformation of the kind of pinching of the lower middle and middle middle class really since uh, the late 1960s. And those background considerations are actually very relevant here. When you look at the larger amount of public provision, including just this kind of hidden provision alone of seven, eight hundred billion dollars a year, the real numbers that have been talked about in terms of faith-based initiatives stand out as being tiny. They are a hundred million dollars uh, at most and less. And there were two executive orders in 2002 and one this year, um, and uh, uh, the largest uh, uh, amount provided was about $100 million. And this is largely 
uh, shuffled amounts within the existing uh, forms of provision that are still uh, dominated by Catholic uh, charities, Lutherans, Church World Services. But uh, I'm ready to vote for you nonetheless. <laughs> All right. I'm glad they, they stayed in Washington. They would not have been able to go, go back, I think. I told you that Stephen Tipton is a treasure on this campus, and we've just seen another virtuoso display of, of intellectual fortitude and, and compassionate thinking, as well as compassionate learning. And I hope that you will join me in a robust round of applause to thank Steve Tipton. I hope that you will be enticed to return to our Family Forum series. If you look in the little red flyer in front of you, you'll see on October 6 at 2.30, we have a forum, Spare the Child. Our colleague, uh, Professor Jan Pratt, will be leading a group of Jewish, Christian, and Muslim thinkers and public policy advocates and religious leaders led by Monica Kaufman, Martha Feynman, and others to talk about the issue of domestic discipline, especially discipline of children a hard issue, contested issue, and one that will be amply ventilated from this lectern. Uh, we hope that you will also give us, do us the favor, please, and look at that little yellow sheet that you got when you came in the door. And if you would be so kind as to simply indicate to us and hand to one of the people at the door how you heard about this forum so we can be more effective in spreading the word about these fora in the future, I'd be most grateful. And finally, I hope you will join me in expressing thanks to my colleagues in the Center for the Interdisciplinary Study of Religion who are instrumental in organizing today's forum and the forum that you have before you, in particular April Bogle, Eliza Ellison, Anita Mann, Amy Wheeler, and Janice Wiggins. Will you join me in a round of applause thanking them for their work? And one final round for Steve Tipton and join us outside for a little refreshments. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All right. Beautifully done. All right. Superb. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.